Welcome, everybody. Hello. It is wonderful to see so many of you here uh, on a Friday afternoon uh, to be back in person for these types of events, uh, both our students and the surrounding University of Michigan and Ann Arbor communities. I'm John Ciorciari. I'm the director of the Wiser Diplomacy Center and International Policy Center here at the Ford School, where I'm a professor and associate dean for research and policy engagement. Uh, I want to thank all of you for attending today's event, which I'll introduce very briefly before I hand it over to my colleague, Genevieve Zubrisky, who is a professor at UM and also directs UM's Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia and Copernicus Center for Polish Studies. I want to give a special welcome today to students who have come from throughout the Midwest uh, here from UM and a number of other universities uh, to participate from Albion College, from Kent State, Michigan State, the University of Chicago, and Wayne State. The students I just mentioned are participating along with their UM colleagues in a two-day Midwest symposium during which they're exploring U.S.-Russia relations and security in Eastern Europe. It's the culminating event in a program that Jean-Viev and I have, uh, have uh, co-led here at UM for the past few years on cultivating future leaders in U.S.-Russia relations, uh, sponsored generously by the U.S.-Russia Foundation. I also want to thank and welcome some special guests who are visiting the university uh, and who are participating in the symposium, uh, Ambassador Mark Pekula, whom students uh, had the benefit of learning from today at a great lunch talk. Uh, we also have Ambassador Dan Shields, who's here visiting us this semester as a visiting instructor teaching on diplomacy in Asia. We have a number of visiting Ukrainian scholars at the university this year. Two of them here in front of me will be presenting to students uh, tomorrow, uh, Anna Taranenko uh, and uh, Ksenia Yutayeva. Uh, and so we thank you all for being here. Your presence is such an important part of what makes the University of Michigan a wonderful hub to study the region uh, and its international politics. Of course, I also want to thank our staff, uh, the great staff of the International Policy Center and the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at UM, uh, who have organized this event together with the Ford School, as well as the surrounding symposium. This afternoon, we're going to explore the diplomacy between the United States, key NATO allies, and Russia uh, around the war in Ukraine. Our panelists are going to consider key Western interests at stake, the evolution of U.S. and NATO approaches to Russia, and evident Russian aims and intentions in Ukraine and the surrounding region. We'll then look to the road ahead, considering realistic goals for diplomacy in the months and years ahead, uh, as well as how to pursue those goals most effectively. We'll leave some time for questions toward the end of today's session, uh, and at that point, we'll encourage you to raise your hands. My colleagues, Katie and Cindy, will have microphones and will circulate around so that everyone can hear your excellent questions. Uh, and now to welcome our uh, outstanding panel of experts. Uh, I'll start uh, from the furthest chair away from me, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, John Byerly, uh, uh, who studied here at the University of Michigan. Uh, he was elected chairman of the U.S.-Russia Foundation in October 2018, and before that role, he served as a U.S. diplomat for three decades in a, a career focused on the Soviet Union and Russia, as well as Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, to his right, uh, former U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Stephen Began, who many of you will know is also here as a visiting uh, uh, international policy maker in residence with our Wiser Diplomacy Center and teaching a class right now on U.S. Uh, foreign policy and grand strategy. Secretary Began has more than three decades of experience in international affairs, in government and in the private sector, including high-level service within the State Department, the White House, and the Congress. Uh, and last but not least, closest to me, uh, the former Polish ambassador to Russia, uh, Katarzyna pelczynska Nawench. Uh, and uh, Ambassador pelczynska Nawench serves as the director of the Institute Strategies 2050, as well as having served as the first female ambassador to Poland to the Russian uh, Federation since the establishment of Polish-Russia relations. So wonderful array of expertise on the panel. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jean-Viev and uh, get our conversation started. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and welcome, everyone, uh, to this panel. And I want to start uh, our conversation by discussing today's events. Uh, today marks a new milestone in the war in Ukraine. 
A few hours ago, Putin formally but illegally annexed four Ukrainian oblasts or regions uh, after a surreal 45 minutes speech in which he presented uh, Russia as the savior of the regions annexed, uh, as the defender of colonized and oppressed people around the world, and as a victim of Western and especially US imperialism. Afterwards, during a Eurovision-like event on the Red Square, some political figures went as far as uh, calling for a Russian jihad against the, the West. So uh, President Zelensky declared that Ukraine would not negotiate with Russia as long as Putin remained in power and reiterated his request for Ukraine to become a man member of NATO. <coughs> so neither the annexation nor Putin's inflamed rhetoric nor the highly choreographed celebration were surprising. We knew it was coming. Uh, but the escalation in the acts of war and the speed at which this is all happening is shocking. So to begin our conversation, I'd like to ask each of you to take, to take stock of today's events and to reflect on the last couple, two, three weeks um, and share your reflections on what you see as the most critical issues and challenges this new phase is bringing about. Um, a new phase and the challenges for Ukraine, obviously, but also for European and US uh, security. And so one question is, you know, am I wrong? Are we, in, are we not in a new phase? Is this something <coughs> new that's becoming, beginning or more of the same? So I'd like to reflect on this and perhaps I will start with Ambassador Bayer. Thank you. And, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here on a Friday afternoon. This is uh, very impressive. I, I guess we have a topic that uh, some people are interested in. <laughs> I think there is a strong smell of desperation in the air in Moscow. Uh, almost everything that we have seen this week, uh, the, the rushed mobilization, the call up of these uh, 30,000 Russians, the uh, hurried attempted, I don't call it annexation, I call it attempted annexation, uh, and the uh, the show that was put on in the Kremlin today, uh, all of that was a result of and was hastened by Ukraine's military successes. So Putin, far from dictating what is going to happen on his terms at the time, he says he is now, I think, in a almost totally reactive mode. I think the uh, the call up of the 30,000 soldiers, the conscripts, conscripts, 300, what did I say? 30. Oh, 300,000, 300,000, uh, I think is a, is a case in point. If you read uh, the intercepts of the Russian soldiers that were printed in the, uh, or that were carried in the New York Times yesterday, actual intercepts of them talking about how hopeless things are, how ill, how ill led they are, how they don't have any food, they don't know why they're there. And these are people who volunteered to go. The people coming now were conscripted, they will have less training and much less of, uh, of, of a sense of ownership of this. I mean, it reminds me of uh, if, you're, if your campfire is going out, uh, you don't throw a bunch of wet wood on top of it. That's, in essence, I think, what Putin is doing to the Russian army. And uh, I don't think this is, uh, is maybe a little too early to say it's a turning point, uh, but it's certainly an inflection point. And, uh, and Putin's speech today, I would recommend everyone here to, to read it. It's already been translated, and it's in the New York Times or the Post. It's absolutely chilling and hair-raising. Thank you. Well, I uh, completely agree with John. He, uh, Putin is desperate, and it's forcing him to do some uncharacteristic things, including improvising. 
He tends to be somebody who plans and ahead, prefers to operate in secrecy. At, at, but since the beginning of this campaign, he's been on his back foot. Uh, th since the beginning, beginning of this war, it's been going uh, against him. And he has lost the war that he started. Um, whether he can afford to lose the war he's in now uh, remains to be seen, but he has lost the war that he wanted to fight in February of this year. Uh, the the so-called campaign to denazify and demilitarize Ukraine, uh, uh, any hopes that uh, any 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 hopes or any uh, any unbelievable expectation that was possible is gone, and now he finds himself in a very tight corner. Uh, it's it's for sure the case that he's facing some of the most severe domestic unrest that he's seen in his 20 years, 22 years in office. Um, he's used to occasional protests from his liberal opponents, his liberal pro-Western, perhaps even pro-democratic uh, opponents at home, but he has suppressed, repressed, or even killed many of them. And, and that's not what worries him. What worries him is he's also facing uh, protests and complaints from his supporters from the extreme faction of the Russian political spectrum that is angry at Putin for not being brutal enough in the campaign in Ukraine. And that's what Putin was responding to. But it, it wasn't just that. Just a week and a half ago, he was in Samarkand, Uzbekistan, for a meeting of the, uh, of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a stylized organization uh, of of mostly, uh, mostly thuggish and undemocratic states that was designed by design a counterweight to NATO. Um, and while he was there, he was openly criticized by the Prime Minister of India, who had been a stalwart supporter of Russia during this, during this fight. And also, it was clear that he was being pressured by the Chinese as he acknowledged that he was eager to answer the concerns that he had heard expressed by Xi Jinping. But even that isn't his worst problem. His worst problem is his, his army's losing the war in Ukraine, and that is his biggest problem. And, and so goes that army, so goes Putin, and he knows it, and that's why he took the steps today, Genevieve. He's desperate to try to change the trajectory and to gain some initiative in this fight. Thank you. I definitely agree that uh, Putin is totally frustrated and he's desperate to do something to change the situation. And my understanding of his, in certain sense, incredible speech today uh, was that he sent three messages to three different audiences. The first one was to uh, his inner circle, that he is still a strong man, that he is still able to take the leadership uh, that his power cannot and should not be undermined. And this is very important because the strength is an important, it's a crucial factor in this Russian KGB political culture. Second message was sent to us, so the collective West, but I believe that it was more even addressed to the Europeans than to the US. And he just, demonstrated his determination, his power, he escalated and simply he said, I am ready to do anything it takes to win the war. So you should really be afraid of me and think twice uh, if you are ready to confront me. And uh, Putin understands that uh, European Union, although it's been really acting in a very unified way, and, uh, way in the recent months, still European Union, these are 27 different countries and they can be divided. And there is gro growing war fatigue mm -hmm. in some uh, member states and there are also deep divisions within the member states. So what he tries to say is, uh, think twice if you really want to continue this war and whether, uh, because I am absolutely determined. And that was the second message. And the third message was to the, uh, it was global. Uh, Putin understand that there is, understands that there is growing gap between the US and the EU and the, the countries of so-called global south. So he intentionally 
positioned himself as someone who defends uh, India, all countries, all nations uh, which have suffered due to the American imperialism. And that, that's, um, that's propaganda or the narrative which may work in some regions. It also may work even in some sections and some member states uh, in the EU. Uh, and of course, it's, this is the cru crucial question whether this is the continuation or the new, uh, the turning, uh, turning point and new phase of the war. And in certain sense, it's, it's both. Uh, R Russia wants to control Ukraine. Putin wants to defeat Zelensky and through Zelensky, he wants to humiliate the EU and the US. So this is the continuation. But for the Russian society, this is a completely new phase of the war. As mm -hmm. uh, over recent seven months, they've been explained that this is not their war. Uh, it's the special military operation which is taking place somewhere in Ukraine uh, and they can just move on, live their normal life. And then all of a sudden, uh, they were informed that now their sons, husbands, brothers go to the war, are drafted to the war, and they will, send to the will be sent to the front line without any training. Uh, and the war with this annexation of four Ukrainian regions, which are not fully controlled by Putin, uh, the war was brought to Russia. And, uh, Russian people, ordinary people, suddenly became the part of the military conflict. So for them, that is a huge change. So returning to something you just said about the danger that this, the speech highlighted about the, th the threat of nuclear warfare, for example, or the use of, of nuclear <coughs> weapon on the one hand, um, and the call for this jihad by his supporters, for example. Um, now we're in, in the seventh month of the war um, and we're starting to see that war fatigue, uh, prices, inflation is, is rampant and much greater in Europe than it is uh, in North America. Uh, there's a harsh winter coming. Uh, people are told, you know, in France and Germany to buy warm clothes because, uh, and <coughs> even being warned that there might be blackout. So electrical power might go out. So facing threats from the outside and also having their quality of life diminished, do you see that as really a major threat to an international consensus, which so far has been quite great, you know, in support of Ukraine and in, you know, against Russia? How, how much do you see, well, that's for the three, the three of you. <laughs> Do you think that there's a danger now that the really the international community will start to really show divisions about this so and that? I'll jump in, Genevieve. The, um, this is definitely what Putin thinks. Putin thinks that uh, time is on his side. He thinks that the, the determination of the, uh, Europeans to oppose him uh, is not for the long term. And, uh, and he also thinks that uh, here in the United States, even at some point, there will be a fatigue with this. I think. Uh, President Zelensky's concerns could be the same and, and may in part account for the very successful counteroffensive that really uh, drove home the fact that the Ukrainians will be successful in this, in this fight with the support that they're getting. But in any event, that's, that's President Putin's play. And, that, and, and as the ambassador said, uh, he's trying to put additional pressure and raise the stakes for European populations in, in order to try to achieve that end. You know, the truth is nobody has a lot of time in this one. Uh, in a sense, he is right that there will be a fatigue in the West, I'm sure, at some point, and also uh, our ability to sustain the level of economic and military support for Ukraine may not be indefinite. But Putin also has some constraints on him. His economy is weakening, uh, not as fast as many would have hoped, but his economy is weakening. His army is, is just sorely debilitated by uh, their performance in Ukraine, and so Putin doesn't have time either. And I think, in a sense, what you're seeing is a, a growing urgency in all parts, Ukraine, the West, and Russia, as we go into the fall with this conflict. Uh, 
Putin is uh, definitely good in one thing. So he knows how to integrate the West. Anytime uh, <laughs> some divisions in Ukraine, <laughs> he's good at uniting yeah, Ukraine too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So anytime some divisions appear in Europe between the member states, Putin does something which, which immediately mobilizes the West and mobilizes the European Union. Uh, and I believe that what has just happened with uh, sham referendums, with this uh, uh, annexation and this awful theater uh, in Kremlin today. And this is just the first phase because on Monday we will see the uh, unanimous, I believe, vote in Russian Duma and the change of Russian constitution. Um, so, uh, but but uh, that does not mean uh, that there are no uh, serious divisions, that there are no uh, differences uh, within the EU. Uh, but these uh, divisions are not uh, between the East and the West of the EU. Uh, unfortunately, this is Hungary, the country which borders Ukraine, which is the only EU member state um, openly pro-Russian. All the other member states are uh, definitely anti-Russian, they are pro-Ukrainian. The divisions are more between those who believe that Russia should be defeated and punished and between those who think that we should try to achieve peace at any cost as quickly as possible. So, uh, and of course in Polish society there is almost total consensus that Russia should be defeated and punished, while in France, Italy, mm -hmm. it's 50-50. Uh, it's in interesting because in Germany the majority believes that Russia should be defeated and punished, and it's it's um, th there is a gap between the um, position of the majority of population and the uh, position of the present government, or rather even not the whole government, as they have even divisions inside the government. Um, just one more wor word about economy, as economic warfare is very fa painful for Europe uh, and it's much more painful for Europe uh, than for the United States. Um, it's the, the prices of um, oil doubled, the prices of coal tripled, the prices of gas increased fivefold, so this is uh, really uh, a shock for the governments and for the society but there is no way back uh, with the sabotage on the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, which happened a couple of days ago. Everyone in Europe understands that there is no way that Europe will continue its dependency on Russian energy resources. So even these governments, uh, which believe that they would like to cooperate in Euro with, with Russia, now they understand that there is no such a way, there is no such a chance for them to re-establish uh, this cooperation uh, and that is true that Russian economy proved to be surprisingly resilient uh, to this uh, unprecedented sanctions but um, with the coming sanctions and the end of uh, import of Russian oil by the end of this year uh, Russia will be deprived of the most important uh, revenue uh, and the most important uh, source of financing of Russian budget and the war. And this will happen by December. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why Putin escalates, because he believes that he should threaten uh, this, the, the West now, as in half a year it will be even not only militarily, but also economically too late for him. I think Putin has made four fundamental miscalculations in all of this, very uncharacteristic for him. Uh, whether they're fatal miscalculations, we'll see. And three of them are already fait accomplis. There's one that still has to solve itself. Clearly, he miscalculated the will and the capacity of the Ukrainian state and people and army to oppose him. No question about that. I think he also miscalculated 
the degree of political dissension in the United States. I think that he was counting, based on what he had seen, mm -hmm. uh, that there would be a fracture at some point between the Democrats and the Republicans or maybe within each of those parties. And, and that hasn't happened at all. As someone who lives in Washington, I can tell you there is basically only one issue that is a bipartisan issue on Capitol Hill, and, th and that is Ukraine. So that's the second fundamental miscalculation. Uh, I think that he also, I, I'm sure that he also miscalculated the European Union's capacity to be cohesive on this. Uh, it's always been his hope that he can sort of divide and conquer. Uh, but, you know, we, we really have to see. And the fourth, uh, well, uh, I would add to that the amount of coordination between the United States and the European Union is remarkable and unprecedented. And that's a fait accompli that I don't think uh, will break as well. The fourth miscalculation, and we will see how it turns out, is the one we've been talking about. Putin is convinced that he could outlast, outweigh Europe, uh, that a cold winter would eventually begin to fracture the consensus against him. And again, we have seen the Europeans come together to prepare for this in a way, not just buying blankets, but mm -hmm. stockpiling, uh, making sure that there's enough uh, energy on tap. Uh, and I think when that hits home, if Putin is still with us at that point, uh, that could be the last prop that gets knocked out from under him. So what do you mean if he's still with us? I mean, do you? <laughs> <laughs> So do you expect that it's, you know, you're thinking the long durée, long term, or you could imagine a change at the top? I mean, do you think that change will come from the top or bottom up? Um, I think in a system like that, uh, where there is basically no accountability to anyone, and where Putin's number one main interest is a single hyphenated word, self-preservation. He has to be on his guard constantly to make sure that the people who have been supporting him up till now, because he's been pretty good at what he's, what he's done, uh, they may start to look at him in a different way. And I'm talking about the people at the top. Change will never come from the bottom in Russia. Um, a very uh, good friend of mine, a Russian, once said, when you think about Russia, and the political climate in Russia, imagine it as a big opera house. And on stage is Putin, Patrushev, Shoigu, the, you know, the inner circle around Putin. In the orchestra seats, the, the expensive seats, are the elite. And they're applauding and you know, uh, watching the show and going along with it. But they are also looking over their shoulders. They're looking over their shoulders into the balcony seats, the second, third, fourth balcony. And those are the people with the muddy boots. And when those people begin to clap, and clapping in Russia means get off the stage when it's done rhythmically, uh, then I think Putin and the people on stage and the elite will try to get out and preserve themselves as soon as possible. Do you want to add to this exchange? Or? I, I agree with John that, that it will not be a bottom-up change. But the reality that we have to confront is that Putin is most likely to be overthrown by the more extreme faction in his own country. Right. Um, it, won't be, uh, it won't be kind of the pattern that we saw in the 1990s uh, play out at the end of uh, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's tenure. This will be uh, a two Brutus. Uh, standing on that stage, I was thinking they're performing Julius Caesar, John, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 the and the hand on that proverbial knife could be uh, uh, Shoigu, could be Nikolai Patrushev, it could be uh, any number of figures who may uh, f foretell an even worse period in relations with Russia. So we have to be mindful that that it, it, if Putin goes, it's well, it, it, you know, it, 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 we certainly shouldn't 
oppose uh, Putin being removed from office, but if his own people get rid of him, we shouldn't assume that it means that things will get better. better. So in that case, mm -hmm. in that case, what should the goals of the U.S. and its close allies in NATO and the EU be? Um, is there any path forward for diplomacy, or is diplomacy we're beyond diplomacy at this point, or? What do you, is there a path forward, basically? What you're describing is, you know, basically Putin might disappear, but will get worse. Things will get worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and things are not going very well now. So um, what does that mean for security for Europe? For Ukraine, of course, we have to keep in mind that this is this is the war is being fought on Ukrainian ground, and Ukrainians are dying as we speak. Um, is there a way forward with diplomacy, or should we, you know, hear Zelensky and think about accepting Ukraine and NATO? Uh, should we continue the line of no, because this will make things worse? We have Finland and Sweden who asked also to uh, become members of NATO. I think, I think in the short term, the most important thing is to keep the pressure on, the pressure that has been put on him by the sanctions, by the Ukrainian army trained and equipped by the West, uh, increasingly by the international community, Modi and uh, Xi Jinping, for example. Uh, the worst mistake we could make now would be to back off because he's making nuclear threats, uh, because he said that these uh, provinces are now part of Russia. Uh, none of that has any basis at all uh, in, in fact. The, and the, the nuclear threat, uh, we could talk about that separately. We have to take that very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I don't think that we can allow that threat to make us lose our resolve. As far as diplomacy goes, I think it's very important that we keep uh, relations with Russia, that we don't break relations. I think it's extremely important that we're going to have an American ambassador in Moscow, hopefully in a couple of months. Uh, I think it's important that Jake Sullivan can get on the phone and call his counterpart, Patrushev. Uh, not so much to negotiate, but to deliver messages. Uh, that's how the message was delivered about the catastrophic consequences that would ensue from any Russian use of nuclear weapons. Uh, but I think we're very, very far from any kind of diplomatic solution which would mean concessions by either side, because what I heard from both Zelensky and Putin today was very far from anything that looks like a concession. I think that the mo uh, diplomacy is it's, it's all it's always somehow uh, operating. Uh, there was uh, the um, war prisoners uh, exchange. Uh, there was this uh, grain deal between Russia, Turkey, and Ukraine. So wherever there is a room for diplomacy, it's there and it's quite effective. Uh, I agree that at the moment there is no much this the room left for uh, diplomacy. Definitely back channels are important and I very much hope that uh, messages which should be delivered uh, were delivered uh, to, to Russia so they know what they can expect in the case they uh, escalate uh, uh, towards nuclear, that there will be a nuclear escalation. Uh, but s obviously at certain point uh, diplomacy uh, will be very useful and will be necessary. But what we should uh, remember and what we should understand that always when we start negotiations with Russia, it should be from the position of strength and not weakness. Uh, all kind of 
um, narrative about dialogue, understanding, channels of communication, so on and so forth, can be very easily misunderstood by the Russians and taken as uh, signals of weaknesses. And if the, uh, Putin and the uh, Russian regime feels that the uh, opponent is weak, then they just escalate and this is the end of any effective uh, negotiations and any uh, effective uh, diplomacy. Uh, and just uh, one word about, uh, if I may add to this discussion about the role of Russian society and whether the system can be overturned or put in somehow disappear <laughs> due to the um, bottom uh, up um, uh, ac uh, actions. Um, I believe that at certain points some major protests in Russia are possible. But unfortunately, uh, remembering the Belarusian <coughs> experience, when uh, where uh, I mean definitely the majority of the Belarusians were totally against, Luka against Lukashenko and the protests um, uh, which took place across whole Belarus uh, and lasted for months, and at the end of the day, uh, there was very brutal, very cr cruel crackdown on uh, civil society. Uh, and that's unfortunately will happen in Russia if people, if uh, people s do the same, if people in Russia do the same as the Belarusian the citizens did. So um, unfortunately, this is the reason why, why uh, the regime uh, may change or the leadership may change um, mo only uh, due to some coup d'etat or some change in Putin, some uh, change, changes in the Putin inner circle. But it is possible that once, if protests uh, start in Russia, this can be used by some people from the inner circle to get rid of Putin. So I would see this as the most likely scenario for the leadership change. And then, of course, the question arises whether leadership change in Russia will lead to regime mm -hmm. change or it will just mean the continuation under different uh, leadership. Just on negotiations, I would say I com I com agree completely with the importance of the potential for diplomacy and also the conditions not being anywhere close to uh, 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 what would be necessary for that to happen. But I'd add one other caveat is whatever diplomacy happens should be uh, driven by the interests of Kyiv. Mm -hmm. The Ukrainian government, uh, we, uh, John mentioned the miscalculations, the underestimating of the Korea, uh, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian state. Um, Ukrainian military, uh, that, those um, miscalculations weren't just in Moscow. There were many in the West who did the same, and, and we uh, certainly owe it to the Ukrainians not to do that again. Um, anything that happens should happen from a position of strength, and it should be led by the Ukrainians. So to go back to Ambassador Zbayerly's, uh, your point that what drives Putin is self-preservation. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of constraints can we put on Russia that could actually, you know, work in de-escalating, at least. Well, I've been asked uh, many times how we, uh, how should we react to his now explicit threats to use a nuclear weapon? And my answer is that we've been preparing that for 70 years. Yeah. We have a nuclear deterrent. Uh, not at, at all. Uh, suggesting that we should be prepared for a nuclear war, uh, that's absolute anathema. But the purpose of deterrence is to keep him from doing that. Um, the messages that I believe were sent by the United States government uh, to Moscow were that the United States will intervene in the conflict if he uses a weapon of mass destruction. And I think those are constraints on his choices. He, he may be desperate, he may even be crazy, um, but is he suicidal? Well, Poles have 
you know, peop the immediate neighbors of, of Russia have sometimes believed that, yes, he's suicidal, that he might go till the end because he refuses to step <laughs> down, to back down, to de-escalate. Um, and Poland has a very a long border with Russia, uh, uh, with Ukraine, has welcomed over 3 million Ukrainian refugees, many of whom went back to Ukraine, those who were uh, from uh, regions where the war is not, you know, like the region of Kyiv and Western Ukraine. So we have to think also about the, the, the security of immediate neighbors, the Baltic states, Poland, Romania, Moldavia. So what do you feel or what do you think is the way forward to make sure that these immediate neighbors um, remain safe? For the immediate neighbors, like Poland, and for us, that's been really a strategic earthquake because three of our neighbors, it's Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, are uh, directly involved in the military conflict. Uh, and it's, it was mm, almost seven million refugees uh, refugees uh, who have crossed Polish border since the beginning uh, of this full-scale invasion. Uh, the majority of them, uh, less than five million, came back to uh, Ukraine. Some of them went further west and around two million, million and a half remained in uh, Poland. Uh, but that is an incredible experience for Polish society as in every school, every class, there are Ukrainian kids and Russian language, not Ukrainian, because these are mostly people mm -hmm. from the eastern region, uh, regions of Ukraine, people for whom the first language is Russian, not Ukrainian. So Russian language is now uh, the, the, the next after Polish most uh, popular and uh, sp often spoken ling language I in Poland. So <laughs> it's quite a paradox of this uh, uh, situation. But uh, yes, it is very scary for uh, Polish society. Uh, and to increase, to make uh, us uh, and, and all the, 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 the countries of uh, Central Europe feel more secure, uh, I think that uh, three factors are cru crucial here. Firstly is the unity of uh, the transatlantic alliance, but also unity of the EU and European cooperation. So it's very important for us to trust not only the US, but also trust our European allies that if the worst case scenario happens and the conflict spills over to, uh, I mean, Poland or the Baltic states, they will respect the Article 5 uh, and they will respect the principle uh, of all, all for one, one for all. That's uh, very important, but of course we have our homework to do to encourage this unity and my, I must say that uh, Polish government was really very good as, at handling the refugee uh, crisis and reacting properly, reacting to the invasion. Uh, there are some major problems in our European policy uh, which actually feed some divisions inside the EU and inside the European um, divisions uh, in Europe, which is not good. Uh, so firstly, unity. Secondly, uh, it's uh, strengthening uh, the US and NATO presence in our region, which is already what is already happening. And uh, the third factor is to continue uh, mm, military, but also economic aid to Ukraine, as we are deeply convinced that the Ukrainians are fighting for us. And in case of Poland, in case of the Baltic states, this is not just a theoretical uh, assumption, but this is exactly the case. If uh, Ukraine failed, 
Poland or the Baltic states, uh, I mean, if, if Ukraine fails, and I hope it will never happen, uh, Poland and the Baltic states will be the next. So we absolutely believe that they are fighting for us and therefore the military uh, aid and uh, budgetary aid, which is also very important, uh, is uh, like one of the most important factors for our security. So how do you see the American response for that or what, you know, the path forward for? Oh, well, I think, um, I mean, the constraint that we can most easily put on Putin, I think, is, is a military constraint which uh, challenges his army. Uh, I think the sanctions are the sanctions. I don't think that they will bring the Russian economy to its knees anytime soon. And the Russian people have an almost limitless capacity to take this on board, to take one for the team, so to speak. Uh, but militarily, I think, to get very um, uh, precise about this, uh, I think it's time for us to look at those weapon systems that we have been holding in reserve, saying we don't want to uh, provoke Putin. We don't want to uh, make him escalate. Well, guess what? He just escalated the war significantly. So uh, from the American side, I would say Abrams tanks, which have sort of been a no-go up until now, German Leopard tanks, uh, and uh, sophistic sophisticated aircraft, F-16s. Uh, I think it's time to talk about that seriously. Uh, it's, uh, it's already being talked about in Germany. Mm -hmm. Two of Schultz's coalition partners have already come out uh, tougher than he is. And I think when Congress gets back from the midterm elections, you're going to hear a renewed call for more, uh, a, a higher grade of weapon. Uh, and that will have uh, the same effect on the battlefield that those HIMARS uh, long-range missiles have. And I think there's one last thing that's very important for us to do in the democratic West, and that is uh, be forthcoming and honest with our own people. You know, Putin's play is that he's going to catch us in the same lie that he got caught in, his special military operation, but insulating his population from it. We, the democratic West, the leaders of Europe, the leaders of the United States, need to make the tough uh, case to their people on why this hardship is worth enduring, whatever small amount of hardship we're enduring compared to the people of Ukraine uh, today, and, and ensure that we remain unified in our own societies, not just between our institutions or within our institutions, but within our societies. Uh, our elections, European elections, will be opportunities for uh, Putin to exploit. Um, he's already shown a propensity to do so, certainly in, in both Europe and the United States. And our leaders, our political leadership needs to anchor our policies in the popular support of the people. Thank you. Did you want to add something yeah, else? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this. As theoretically, I agree that there should be a very clear uh, message from the elites or from the um, decision makers to wider public that we have to suffer for a while in order to defeat P uh, Putin and to guarantee or to f the sustainable peace in Europe. Uh, but there is always um, but public uh, opinion polls show quite um, hmm. Uh, I mean, it's quite significant and growing gap between the uh, decision makers' position on Ukraine and Russia and Europe and the wider public. Uh, and this is definitely the case in Italy. This is the case, this was the case <laughs> in Italy. Uh, this is the case in, uh, uh, in France, in Spain, in Portugal. Uh, but it's also the case in Slovakia. Uh, the um, polls show that 50% of Slovakians are against, uh, are in favor of Ukraine, but 50% uh, just want peace at any cost. Uh, and even if 
uh, that would mean uh, serious territorial concessions uh, by Ukraine. And in Prague, just a couple of days ago, there was second huge uh, demonstrations of people who demanded just uh, um, gas supplies from Russia, and even there were demands of uh, leaving the EU and NATO. I know that uh, it's not that it does not necessarily reflect the position of the whole society, uh, but uh, Euroscepticism uh, has increased both in Slovakia and in Czech Republic. So, in, in I mean, in this co context, polls are quite and the Baltics uh, uh, are quite unique that with this very consensual approach to Russia, to Ukraine, and to war. Uh, and this growing gap, as I said, between the decision makers and the public, it is a real problem in the democratic uh, uh, countries. I mean, in Russia, Putin can totally disregard what his people think, but in democratic Europe, decision makers just want to be re-elected. That's the normal thing in democracy. So it's not that easy for them to, to just to go to the people and say you are frustrated with the suffering which uh, you already experienced. But the message I would like to, uh, uh, but what I would like to say is tell you is that you will suffer more. That is not the best recipe for the victorious election, unfortunately. But what, what, I, what I would say, and I don't disagree with you on your mm. description of the condition, if they don't do it, then Vladimir Putin will. So wh who do you want speaking to your s democratic society? Do you want Russian propaganda, Russian disinformation, or I is it a moment in which the democratic leaders of the West need to make those tough appearances and make the case for this? We need to do it here in the United States too. We have the same yeah, conditions, perhaps right. less acute in the United States, but if we are, this is what Putin's calculation is. Putin's calculation is that he can outlast us. And it's going to take our democratic political leadership to, to ensure that we're insulated against his manipulations. Uh, so I, I don't think we have a choice. Yeah, but this is uh, why I said that Putin is really master in unifying the West. Because uh, I'm not sure that, uh, like, like Trink, that it's better to tell people you will suffer. Some of them will believe, some of them will just uh, support another political party. But if people see the atrocities which uh, are happening under Russian occupation, when they see uh, what uh, Russia uh, did in uh, eastern Ukraine, when they see this sham referendums and this terrible theater in the Kremlin, that is the message which really unifies the European Union, uh, European public, and mobilize uh, uh, the West to, to, do, to, to fight against Putin. And uh, just decision makers should uh, make sure that this pictures, uh, this uh, information is properly delivered to the public. Yeah, I completely agree. That, that we, but that's what our leaders have to do, is they have mm. to make clear that we understand the stakes, mm. what's at stake, not just the hardship, but why the hardship yeah. is worth right. making. And it is, for all the reasons you mentioned. What he's doing has the possibility of throwing the entire continent of Europe into war. Absolutely. And, and we, need to, we need to stop him here. On that note, unless you have something to add, I think it's uh, time to open the floor to your questions. Uh, we have staff, people with microphones. So if you can raise your hand to me and they will bring a microphone to you. Here. Uh, we have our Ukrainian Scholar at Risk Fellow, Oksana mm -hmm. Chabanyuk. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I'm a, I'm a Scholar at Risk Fellow at the WCEE, um, Kharkiv, Ukraine. Um, I have a very short question, but uh, I hope to receive your uh, expertise uh, answer. 
Uh, what um, answer would you predict Ukraine will receive from NATO after today's application? Um, for instance, uh, Ukraine doesn't have uh, the uh, sufficient uh, air defense uh, weapons to close the sky and um, the airstrikes which are against civilians in the cities are very horrible. Uh, for instance, the missile reaches from the border of Russia to Kharkiv only during three minutes. Thank you. Who wants to take? So I, I don't think the political conditions are in place and, and I wouldn't advocate for Ukraine's full entry into NATO at this moment. In the midst of an act of war, uh, it would uh, be a just response, but it would almost be the equivalent of Putin's annexation of the four territories and placing his new border right in the middle of the conflict zone in Zaporizhia, in Donetsk, Luhansk, and, and Kherson. What I would do instead is I would treat Ukraine as a de facto NATO member yes. in providing We're all doing. forms of military assistance to them in order to help their defense. Um, the uh, Making the case to, to get directly involved in this war right now um, is, 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 is simply not something that you would be successful. In fact, it would very likely backfire in terms of gaining support in the West to sustain the effort against Putin. I would just make sure the Ukrainians have everything they need, including some of the equipment yeah. that Ambassador Byerly was mentioning uh, to defend themselves. Yeah, and I would add, we don't need to be involved. I think the Ukrainians are doing a pretty good job with our material, with our training, de facto NATO member, as you said, um, as long as they keep advancing, and they do seem to keep advancing, uh, I think, it's, it's off the table, really. Hello, uh, I'm a student here at the Ford School of Public Policy, and um, I had a question regarding um, the recent border clashes in uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, as well as Armenia and Azerbaijan. How do you really think that um, Russia has impacted those, and what do you guys see coming in the next six months, a year, uh, in terms of those conflicts? I know Armenia and Azerbaijan have had long-standing tension, but it just seems to be getting worse, especially over the past couple of years. Good question. Uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, remember that was um, a, a sort of uh, settlement that was brokered by Russia and involves the stationing of Russian troops uh, in, uh, in Armenia. Uh, I'm not really sure that Russia can afford to station a lot of troops there. So I think what you're seeing happening uh, there in Tajikistan with Uzbekistan uh, and, and possibly elsewhere, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, is what happens when there is a distraction at the top. Uh, when there's a sense that uh, there's an opening, there's an opportunity to make some gains because Russia is not going to be in a position to stop it. And uh, I'll tell you what I, what I worry about is uh, Georgia. Uh, Saakashvili is not uh, in charge anymore, mm -hmm. uh, but I could imagine there are discussions going on in Georgia saying, is this the time for us to try to take back South Ossetia, to try to take back Abkhazia, because the Russians will be in no position to counter us. It, it won't be this Georgian government, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I just add, I'd expand it out a little bit. What you're seeing, I think, is a, a, a um, loosening of Russia's grip over these uh, former Soviet territories. Um, John mentioned uh, Uzbekistan, he mentioned Tajikistan. Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan have been fighting a border clash as well at the same time. And what's happened is, is uh, it, uh, you know, Russia's attention and its, its influence are redirected in a different direction. It's kind of like if you're Lord of the Rings fans, uh, the Eye of Sauron has moved off of them. And, uh, uh, and, and what you're seeing is, is uh, not a vacuum, but a vacuum being filled by China. Um, if you, you know, the headline for those of us who watch uh, former Soviet politics from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting was the criticism from Prime Minister Modi and the, the, the implicit criticism from President Xi Jinping of Vladimir Putin's war. But what was really noteworthy to me was the fawning statements that all five Central Asian states released after the bilateral meetings between their leaders and Xi Jinping. China's grip on Central Asia is substantial and growing. 
And it's ironic because the United States two decades ago tried to establish the same kind of influence in the region and faced enormous Russian resistance. There are also challenges to us because we bring normative expectations, human rights, democracy, that were unwelcome by many of the Central Asian leaders. But we have largely, the United States has largely vacated Central Asia as a, as a foreign policy interest. But China is stepping in, and at some point, one has to believe this will generate concern in some corners of the Kremlin as well. I'll go even farther. I would say that this is the last phase of the decomposition of the Soviet empire. And Russia is losing <coughs> Central Asia to China, but it's also losing Azerbaijan to Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, and the recent escalation between Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, was definitely provoked by Azerbaijan, who is stronger now and receives uh, substantial political, but not only political support from uh, Turkey. Uh, Armenia immediately asked Russia for help, but Russia remained silent, which was quite uh, symptomatic. And the intention of Azerbaijan is to get the corridor, exterritorial, or just the uh, Azerbaijani control corridor to Nahichevan, which is Azerbaijani exclave bordering Iran. And that would split Armenia into two pieces and make it, in fact, a kind of crippled <laughs> remainings mm -hmm. of uh, what Armenia used to be. So it's a deadly threat to Armenia and uh, Russian influence in this uh, country, but still uh, Putin remains silent. And as for Georgia, I would be absolutely sure that under this government, they will definitely not claim neither uh, Ossetia, Ossetia nor uh, Abkhazia. And it, it's, uh, I'm not very much in favor of this government, but they are quite clever <laughs> in this respect. Thank you. We have, I will start making a list. You and then another student on this side. So this side and then Ambassador Mil Milovitsky. There's a student Milovitsky. in the back who has a mic. Yeah. Oh, okay. They have the mics already. Okay. So we'll go with you then in the back because you have your microphone. Uh, good evening to, to you all and thank you very much for having this talk. Uh, my question is, how has the level of first-hand accounts of the conflict via social media changed the calculus of American diplomacy, um, especially relating to the 2009 Russian military reorganization and the perceived military might of the Russian machine, um, and how that's being reflected in the actual conflict on the ground at this time, and uh, what the implications are for future conflicts in the age of social media? Thank you. Thank you. Well, the, the one thing to be said is this was a terribly planned military campaign, but I, I think most analysts uh, believe that it was actually an intelligence campaign anyway. It was planned by intelligence officials, but the military was the implementor of it, and it was catastrophic. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the collective West deserves enormous credit for the resolve it's shown from the very beginning. Uh, and. Uh, it was a real reversal of a trend that had started in 2008 with the Russian invasion of Georgia, and then in 2014 with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. Um, the uh, uh, you know this is this is a demonstration, uh, as the ambassador said, that um, that the Europeans and U.S. could work together and that, that that unity is delivered outcome. I think it's reaffirmed U.S. faith in many of our NATO allies and it's also energized our NATO allies. When you look at the scorecard of, of Putin's accomplishments, he's overturned Scandinavian neutrality, he's overturned uh, German pacifism, uh, and he's united the European Union and the United States in, in the great uh, geopolitical challenge of our era. Uh, a pretty extraordinary track record. We have this. Can you stand up so we can see you? Uh, hello, my name is Zaire, and I'm a first year MIRS program student. I'm from Taiwan, and I have a question about the information warfare during this invasion because, as we know, like uh, there are many fake news and propaganda through the internet. So, I want to know if we have any concrete policies toward this uh, 
invasion through the internet. And how do you think about the situation uh, in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> you, you can answer this. So, so maybe I will on informational <laughs> warfare, not on I Taiwan. Think one of, I think one of the most remarkable aspects of uh, this war in terms of information has been uh, a reversal of American policy with regard to intelligence. Uh, we have, I think, the best intelligence gathering uh, apparatus and people in the world, but those, the information uh, that uh, comes from that apparatus and those people has been guarded like, uh, like the crown jewels. Uh, that changed when it became very apparent what Putin was aiming to do in Ukraine. And the American government made, had no compunction about making this public, about sharing pretty sensitive intelligence with the world. Uh, and also, privately, talking to the Russians in a way that uh, leaves the Russians in no doubt that we have uh, a lot of uh, sight, sight lines into what's happening there. Uh, and I'd give our, uh, our friend and colleague, Bill Burns, uh, current director of the CIA, and my predecessor as ambassador in Moscow, a lot of credit for that, because he had to overcome a lot of resistance within the, the CIA to do that. But it was fundamentally important because it pulled the rug out from under all of Russia's efforts to put out what is fake news. And, uh, they really never recovered from that. Information and you know, warfare is like one of the most important elements of this war, uh, next to military, economic, uh, and surprisingly, that that wasn't uh, absolutely obvious for. Uh, Perhaps it was obvious to the U.S. intelligence, but definitely it wasn't obvious to the European experts that this one, this uh, war, uh, would be won so quickly and so easily. Uh, however, uh, I think that the huge role was played here by the Ukrainians and by President Zelensky himself, as he demonstrated incredible leadership and. Uh, incredible charisma mm -hmm. and ability to communicate not mm -hmm. only with his own people but also with uh, specific nations in Europe, in the US, using their cultural codes. Mm -hmm. uh, and th there was lots, th there were uh, huge doubts, I remember, when uh, Zelensky became president, whether he's capable of running such a I mean, big country. but. Uh, his uh, experience, uh, his previous experience, uh, I think that helped him very much in uh, communicating in a very, very effective and professional way uh, with, uh, with the Europeans, uh, American citizens, and of course uh, with the Ukrainians. Uh, there is lots of um, hope in the EU, not in Poland, but in Germany, in France, that uh, Europe will be able to develop some channels of communications with the Russian society. And here I must say that I am very skeptical. I believe that the Russians, there, there are lots of independent uh, source of information uh, run by uh, anti-Putin Russians in, uh, on social media, on Telegram, on uh, YouTube, and this works. So if someone in Russia really wants to learn what's going on, uh, everyone who is more or less sk skillful uh, uh, on the internet can, uh, can, can get access to independent information. And so if the Russians uh, trust any 
no anti-regime information. It will be information coming from the Russians and not from Europeans or from uh, American media. So uh, that's why uh, I think it's very difficult. Actually, it's very difficult to reach out to the Russian society. But if it happens, it will happen thanks to the uh, Russian citizens and not uh, thanks to our effort. The, uh, the question of Taiwan it comes up often in, in whether or not there's anything analogous in China's potential towards Taiwan uh, that would be comparable to Russia's with Ukraine. And I would say generally I don't think there is much uh, in that that is analogous. But it is, it is worth looking at what lessons China might be drawing from this as it thinks about its own policies towards Taiwan. It was just a couple of weeks before the invasion that President Putin was in Beijing with Xi Jinping mm -hmm celebrating what they uh, termed a partnership without limits. Um, it, it, it sure looks like there's some limits on that partnership now. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, China, at least uh, to my knowledge, has not provided any direct military support to China, despite, uh, excuse me, to, to Russia, to Putin, despite being obviously approached by the Russian government uh, for that kind of support. Um, China has paid a substantial economic cost domestically, as have all the rest of the economies in the world from the degree to which the invasion exacerbated already challenging economic conditions. Um, China has seen and found itself in an uncomfortable position of straddling the, uh, the inviolability of borders and, and, and the sovereignty of states with Putin's blatant intrusion into Ukraine and his invasion uh, of his neighbor. And just today, the president of Russia validated in his view that a national referendum could confirm independence <laughs> on territory that other countries might claim. Certainly a principle that, that uh, Xi Jinping would not want to see infecting the political discourse in Taiwan. Um, the, the Chinese are clearly putting some distance between themselves and, uh, and Russia, but we need more from China now. And this will be an opportunity. I'm not, uh, I'm not Pollyannish. But uh, uh, Xi Jinping is in the last few weeks of a leadership selection process, which is highly predictable. He will be the leader of China for a third term after October 16th. And once he's in place, he has an opportunity to help shore up the rules-based order that has benefited China so much over the past three decades. But if he will, uh, then that means he will also have to uh, put pressure on Putin uh, just as uh, we and all other civilized nations must. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a question. My name is Carlos, first year MPP student, and this question is uh, directed to the Deputy Secretary. It's, a, it's like a series of questions regarding the same issue. The first one is, should, in your opinion, the United States uh, make a preemptive strike in Russian soil or in the Ukrainian soil to shift the tides of the war. The second one is if the Russians decide to take it further and actually go with the war, how much would it take Congress to declare it back? And the third one would it is how safe is the United States soil to handle this kind of, uh, as you said, nuclear possibility? So th you know, I, I would frame the, all those questions in the same context of the question about mm -hmm. NATO membership. That at this point, the United States is going to, there are going to be some limits on, on what the United States is going to do, and I think appropriately so, including, for example, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't launch a preemptive strike. And I don't think we should talk a lot publicly about nuclear war either. Uh, you know, I, I, I even get uncomfortable uh, with my own answer about our deterrence, but it's the reality of the world we live in. That, that's, that's how we keep nuclear weapons from being used is with the tool of deterrence, and that's kept the peace for 70 years, thankfully. Um, the, uh, 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 the only circumstances under which I would, uh, it, it, short, of a, short of a weapon of mass destruction, the only circumstances where I would see us making direct strikes uh, back is if Russia violates NATO territory. Um, President Biden has said that he will, the United States and the NATO allies will defend every inch of territory. If Poland, for example, uh, 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 was struck by a conventional attack on an arms depot or something on the border. I think the United States should immediately respond on Ukrainian territory uh, and make it a very, very costly strike against Russian targets in Ukraine. I'd limit it to Ukraine, 
I wouldn't go into Russia proper, but I, I would consider Ukraine everything up to the, to the eastern border of the Donbass and, and Luhansk uh, with Russia. Um, we shouldn't initiate this, but we should be deadly serious that if any attack is launched against NATO, that there will be a response and, quite frankly, an immediate response. Can you stand up, please? It's easier to... Sure. Can you hear me? All right, perfect. I'm Kendrick. I'm a law student here. Uh, and this is kind of continuing on the previous point regarding uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, you indicated previously that the U.S. saw that as a, as a red line beyond which a lot of intervention, perhaps a, 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 a return in nuclear weapons would be necessary. But uh, in terms of the use of smaller, like tactical nuclear weapons or other uh, CBRN weapons, uh, if those were to be used by Russia in Ukraine as a means to uh, raise, to escalate the conflict without necessarily taking it fully, you know, globally nuclear, uh, what would be the U.S. response and how likely do you think Putin is to engage in that kind of behavior? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I don't know if you want to jump in on this, but uh, sure. first of all, there's no, there's no military strategic case to use those weapons in Ukraine. There's no concentration of forces. It wouldn't be effective as a battlefield weapon. And depending on the type of weapon that the Russians might use, it could also have reverberations for their own forces. I mean, you're, you're talking about forces that are in close combat with each other, and it, 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 there's, no, there's no sensible military strategy that would have you use those weapons. But that doesn't mean uh, Putin wouldn't do something for a demonstration effect, perhaps to further test the resolve of the Europeans to send a message that I, I am crazy and, and I'm, willing to, I'm willing to test whether you're suicidal. But in, in any of these cases, and I believe this is the message the United States government has sent uh, uh, to, uh, to the Kremlin, that, that will initiate the same kind of response inside Ukraine that, that uh, I just mentioned a moment ago in the event of an attack on NATO. We have to be absolutely clear, there will be no upside for Putin for the use of weapons of mass destruction. It was a very good op-ed piece today in the Washington Post by uh, uh, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Mike Mullen and Sam Nunn, about this issue. And, and one of the solutions they also propose is it's time for the United States and China to get together and go talk to Russia and tell Putin to just knock it off. One thing, if this helps you sleep better at night, uh, I'm convinced that our American response uh, to Russian use of, let's say, a tactical nuke in Ukraine would be conventional. Uh, as someone said, a strike inside by Americans inside of Ukraine and uh, possibly uh, a, a couple of cyber attacks that could maybe shut down the Russian uh, banking system or blackout cities, uh, that has a demonstration effect too. Mm -hmm. We have, who has a microphone right now? Oh. Hello, uh, my name is Svetlana. I'm Just one second, and then we have <laughs> in front here. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Oh, okay, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad to see everybody. And my name is Svetlana, I'm from Ukraine. I'm a Fulbright fellow here. And um, I'm from Make Alive, and my question is: So you mentioned that uh, um, not uh, all countries are ready to support Ukraine, and uh, uh, maybe not in the way that we really want this uh, support. But of course, we are very grateful for, the, uh, for those countries who support us and who help a lot. My question is that: um, What do you think? In what way uh, it is possible to persuade other countries and other leaders to help more? Thank you. That is a very good question, uh, and there are two ways. One I've already mentioned: that's just to show to uh, to the Europeans what's really. Uh, happened in Ukraine, how, uh, how Russia and Russian soldiers uh, behaved uh, on Ukrainian territory. Uh, and by this, through sending this message, it mobilizes uh, European public and the European public then exerts pressure on their government. And actually this happened in Germany uh, as I think that Germany is the only member state uh, in which the government was much more reluctant 
in terms of providing uh, both military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine, much more reluctant than the German public. Mm -hmm. And there were huge demonstrations in Berlin and the pressure worked. Finally, uh, some uh, military aid was delivered. Uh, but then again, Chancellor Scholz promised uh, um, next, uh, next weapons uh, s supplies uh, but he didn't didn't uh, deliver on this promise. So again, there was pressure from experts, from uh, f from uh, from from the wider public, and again, it worked. Uh, so this is one way, and of course, uh, another way is to create like-minded coalitions, and this is up to the governments, like. Polish government, and I think that Polish, Poland uh, could have here a special important role to create such like-minded countries and governments coalitions, which would put forward some uh, s specific proposals uh, how, to, uh, how to increase and how to handle the uh, long-lasting and sustainable support to Ukraine. But as I mentioned, unfortunately, the Polish government um, is... Uh, um, like, although the Polish government was uh, very effective with pro-Ukrainian policy and uh, supporting the uh, refugee, uh, Ukrainian refugees in Poland, uh, they are very anti-European anti and anti-German uh, in the European policy and inside Poland. That makes very difficult for uh, Polish Prime Minister and even for Polish President to go to Germany, to go to France and to convince <coughs> them that they should mm -hmm. send more weapons and more money to Ukraine. Uh, and it would be um, I mean, the best partners for Poland are not in Central Europe, <coughs> but are in uh, between the Nordic states. The, the, this, this could be Sweden, Finland, Denmark, but it happens that all these countries are also very sensitive on the issue of the rule of law. And here again, Poland has uh, quite significant problems in this <coughs> sphere, and that makes it very difficult for the government to create this Polish, Nordic, North, uh, South uh, coalition. <coughs> Countries uh, which border Belarus, Russia and Ukraine coalition, which will convince other European member states to increase military and financial support to Ukraine. So that would be the best strategy, for, but for the... Uh, for, for, for these reasons, Poland, unfortunately, is unable to, to create so, uh, such coalitions. And, uh, and since Poland is the biggest country uh, of Central Europe, the biggest country which borders uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, there is no other um, so much engaged and uh, member state which can which would be able to, to create this coalition and to strengthen and to convince other member states to to strengthen the support and the problem in Europe now is that in fact Europe is leaderless in this um, in this policy towards the war or um, to put it frankly Europe outsources outsource leadership to the US uh, and this is not the best strategy for the war which is taking place in Europe and in our neighborhood and not in your neighborhood. So we have time for one more question. Mm. Look, now I'm torn. I can give... I'll make it short. I can give the voice to you, Ambassador Levitsky, or to two Ukrainian fellows. <laughs> so, if it, um, maybe you can be very brief, both of you, and then Mel can make a very ple and then that will serve as a roundup. Uh, we can go over a little bit too. I defer to John on 
that issue. We're obviously not out of talking. Thank about you very much. Maybe somehow our questions might coincide. Yes. <laughs> I hope so. So thank you very much. My name is Anna Taranenko. I'm a part of the Ukrainian Scholars Program with our Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And following up on the uh, topic of nuclear energy. Uh, Regarding the situation with Enerhodar, this uh, nuclear plant um, uh, close to Zaporizhia, overtaken now. Um, at this point, like it, at this like age of like um, in these circumstances, even without nuclear weapons, in such cases, if such nuclear object is overtaken, do you think that? Um, it somehow changes the energy security landscape. For instance, will uh, countries in the future somehow change their attitude even to like atomic energy, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes? For instance, uh, like make constructing less atomic plants. Because on the one hand, like we are all facing uh, climate change like on the planet and atomic nuclear energy is considered like cleaner than like oil uh, as, as a supply. So do you think it will affect somehow or maybe not? Thank you so much. Le Yuri, ask your question. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, ambassadors. Uh, my name is Yuri Kaparulin. I'm a state professor at Kherson State University, and I am uh, Whitney Fellow at the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia Studies. So my question, if shortly, what uh, I found very interesting detail in this today's spe speech of Putin. He uh, spoke not only about uh, uh, war against collective West, but also uh, against uh, anglo sex mm -hmm. and then he told and sp uh, spoke about genocides in mm -hmm. U.S. history. So, what is mean on diplomatic level language? <laughs> Maybe I can uh, uh, say more, but if shortly, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. you need a microphone. Okay. No, just a. Uh, uh, Comments actually, and, and by the oh. way, <laughs> one, one, one. Okay, just you make okay. the other one. one, <laughs> one okay, one. You can one make comment. the other one at dinner. I, I just want to make a comment about international law and why resolving this issue is important for international law. If 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 the uh, if Putin or the Russians, I would say, because it's not just Putin, gets away with this, it, it, there are so many situations around the world where bad neighbors are at each other's throats that this, I think, is a real test case. It's one that is delicate, and it's one that certainly the United States was, doesn't want to get involved in physically itself, but it's something that we have to have persistence with. And I agree with what you said about Putin. You know, if he were the historian looking at U.S. history, he could well think that we'd get tired of this, that we don't, and, that, and, that's, and that's a danger. I don't think we will in this case because the administration has staked out a very strong position on this. But, you know, this has to be resolved. And it's a much bigger issue than just Russia, Ukraine. I think it's a big international issue. So I just wanted to, to point that out for some of my students. <laughs> my course. Thank you very much. So you have three different questions. Well, I'll, take a, I'll take a crack at the nuclear one. Great. Uh, I think there is a risk that this war will have an effect on the, what I see as a sort of very slow emerging international consensus uh, that uh, nuclear energy needs to be looked at seriously as one of our responses to climate change. I think it's possible if there is a leak, if there is some sort of catastrophic event that happens. And that's why I think, to go back to the question of uh, diplomacy and keeping space for diplomacy open, uh, the IAEA, as far as I know, those inspectors are still in uh, Zaporizhia, uh, and uh, it's very important that they continue to work with both sides to make that uh, basically a demilitarized zone. I agree with Ambassador Levitsky that the stakes here, they can seem theoretical, uh, but they are very real. In the, in the historical sweep that Putin is trying, covers in his, in his revisionist history, in the period that he wants to rewrite the history for, there's not a border between Russia and the United Kingdom that is in the same place it was during that period. Europe has seen a shifting of borders. It, it, Putin goes back to the collapse of the Russian Empire, when the Ottoman Empire and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and even the German Empire, the Prussians, there's not a border that, that could be secured. Now, we have done a lot 
in, in Western and Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe over those years, including uh, the very wise decision, in my view, to enlarge NATO and to enlarge the European Union, which overcame those borders with supranational bodies that helped cement the status quo. Just imagine what would be happening in Poland today as not a NATO member with this invasion. Just think about the meltdown that would be happening in this region that was the, the, was the uh, vortex for the two world wars that we fought in the 20th century. Thank goodness prudent uh, decisions were made to strengthen the sovereignty and security of those states. But parts of, parts of Europe still remain outside that, and it's obvious that that's the playground in which Putin is playing. There's one other thing I want to say. I just, it's wonderful to see so many Ukrainian participants here. And I don't think I've uh, uh, tried to hide my enormous sympathy and, and, uh, and uh, respect for what your country and what your people are doing. But I, it's also with a sense of loss that I sit here. Like, like the two ambassadors on either side of me, we have spent much of our lives working in or with Russia. Um, and there was a day when we would have an equal number of Russian participants in this session. And it really, it, ever since I began my first undergraduate course here at the University of Michigan as a Russian major, it has been part of my life for 37 years. And that's all gone. And you know, John knows my mantra about uh, Russia. It said, uh, don't, don't give in to Putin, but don't give up on Russia. And it seems <laughs> awfully hard now to hang on to that. But, but really, we have to find a way to bring the Russian people back to, not under Putin, and not without uh, a, a price to be paid by the authors of this brutal and terrible war. But um, we can't give up on the Russian people either. Thank you. When uh, Fukushima uh, catastrophe happened in uh, Japan, Germany decided to close, close all the nuclear power plants in Germany. Uh, and together with uh, green uh, energy transformation, it led Germany to a very high uh, dependency uh, on Russian energy, um, on Russian actual natural gas supplies. So at the moment, it's a total top priority for everyone in Europe to just cut mm -hmm. off this uh, dependency of the Russian energy, uh, um, of, of the Russian fossil fuels. Uh, and that's why I, I don't think that anyone in Europe now uh, will think about uh, closing nuclear power plants. Actually, there is quite significant debate in uh, Germany how to reverse some decisions mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which had been already made. So maybe in the medium long term perspective, we will come back to this issue, but at the moment this is mostly about cutting off Russian oil and Russian natural gas. Putin's pointing to uh, the UK, to the US, that's, that's the element of his uh, propaganda. Of, uh, there, there is uh, small evil, this is the U, and there is the huge evil standing behind the U, Satan. and we are actually the puppets in Europe, we are the puppets of this huge evil, and that is uh, the US. Uh, so that's, that's been always his propaganda, and of course he uh, continues to present it this way uh, to his people, but also to the Europeans, as he understands that, the, that he can you know, uh, fuel anti-American sentiments not only in Europe but also uh, across the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think that everyone here is aware that such sentiments uh, uh, exist and, and this is uh, the serious uh, problem uh, for, for the US but also for the European Union. Uh, and I just wanted to definitely very much agree with your words about uh, Russia. Uh, it's 
it's especially important for Poland as Russia will never ever disappear. It will always be where it is and it will be next to Poland. So it's absolutely crucial for my country that one day there will be peaceful, civilized uh, government and that the Russian people will again be able to travel to Europe, cooperate with us and we will feel safe with them and they will feel, feel safe with us. Uh, we understand after the three decades of, uh, uh, of last three decades that this will not happen overnight. It takes generations for the uh, for people to to change to transform their mindset. But still, we definitely cannot give up on the Russians because they are in Europe and even though now they believe that they can somehow become a part of uh, Pax Chinese, is that mm -hmm. something like Pax Chinese? Uh, there is nothing like this and they are just Europeans. We have to Amen. conclude. I would like to thank our distinguished guests for joining us today and to everyone here to be, uh, to, to having joined us.